to introduce Maya, who's our first speaker today um, from UK. Maya Forstatter came into the gender debate as the claimant in an employment tribunal test case on belief discrimination when she lost her job after tweeting and writing about sex and gender. She's the co-founder of Sex Matters. So welcome, Maya, and thank you so much for the work you've done and for standing up for all of us. Um, it's made certainly my life a lot better, what you've done um, in my workplace. I feel so much more confident and I think I can speak for so many people that what you've you've done so far has been absolutely um, so important to all of us. And what you're doing now with Sex Matters and have been doing for a couple of years is also uh, wonderful. So thank you so much. And um, over to you. For your... I'm going to talk about um, our campaign, campaign about violence against women. Uh, but if people want to talk about the school's campaign and that comes up in the q and I'll, I'll pick it up then. Um, so I'm Maya Forstatter. If you say my name at work, uh, particularly in the UK, but also um, in Europe as well, because the case is persuasive, it uh, has the effect of stopping investigations um, and helping people save their jobs. So I feel incredibly proud of that. Uh, but then um, having that right in law turns out not to be enough. We're still being persecuted and harassed as gender critical women. Uh, and so I co-founded Sex Matters in 2020. Uh, it's the campaign for clarity on sex in law and policy focused specifically on the UK. Um, and we're a human rights organization. We're nonpartisan. We're not a women's organization. We don't say that we're a feminist organization, although most of the team and most of the board are women and most of us are feminists. But um, we, we're pitching ourselves as a human rights organization because uh, people come into this issue for so many different reasons. They obviously do come in because of women's rights. They come in because of children. They come in because of because they care about science and institutions um, and gay rights and corruption. Um, and it affects both men and women. Um, and so and also because. Um, the human rights framework is what has been misused to bring gender ideology to capture our institutions and to destroy our rights. And so we think it's the human rights framework that needs to be used to undo that. Um, we're working on a bunch of things at the moment. Um, the three big ones are trying to clarify, trying to get the government to clarify the Equality Act in the UK. So the Equality Act is the law that um, includes all of our equality protections. So sex discrimination, race, disability, age, and so on. And it includes gender reassignment, which is protection against discrimination for trans people. And so sex, gender reassignment are two separate characteristics apart from if someone has a gender recognition certificate and they've legally changed their sex and then they get meshed up together and it becomes a mess and so what we want the government to do is to clarify that for the purposes of the equality act for the purposes of sex discrimination protections and single sex services uh, a gender recognition certificate does not change a person's sex uh, we had a petition which got 110,000 signatures. We had a debate in Westminster Hall in Parliament and now the government is um, working on it. We're starting a whole new campaign to keep the pressure up on them to try and get them to do it before the next election. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, one thing we're working on is uh, gender critical at work. So uh, collecting stories from people about what it's like to be gender critical at work, helping people to understand their rights, helping people to um fight back basically uh and then thirdly the school's guidance so trying to um push the government to bring out good clear school's guidance that that you know schools are they don't know what to do uh and they're looking to the government to tell them what to do with this exponential rise in children saying that they're trans saying that they're gender questioning um how do they protect those children and the other children uh, so those are the three sort of big things we're working on. And then um, 1st of September, we launched a new campaign on the campaign of hate and intimidation against women, which is inherently what um, gender ideology brings to our institutions. And so um, I want to play you the two minute video that we launched on the 1st of September. Um, 
trigger warning, should I say that, um, it will raise your blood pressure. If you don't want to see women being shouted at and thumped, um, look away for about two minutes or turn the sound off. I was going to come here and be really fluffy and be really nice and say, yeah, be really lovely and queer and gay. No, if you see a turf, punch him in the fucking face. The intimidation of women is continuing. Police are doing nothing. For those of you who are not in the UK and haven't been following the story, um, the man at the beginning uh, is a man called Alan Sarah Jane Baker, um, who was the longest serving uh, trans identified man in prison in the UK. He was in a men's prison. Uh, he was there for abduction and torture and then for um, attempted murder while he was in prison. He's been recently released and has been adopted by the trans rights movement. And he turns up outside women's events um, alongside all of the other people who are outside women's events and, and shouts at us and um, intimidates us and, and also walks down the street with his top off and manages not to get arrested for that. Um, and so the video at the beginning is from London Trans Pride, July the 8th in Trafalgar Square, the middle of London, where he stood in front of the crowd and he said, if you see a turf, punch them in the fucking face. And the crowd cheered. And the police did nothing. And women who were there and women who saw it reported it. Uh, and the initial response, one woman who reported it as a hate crime, she got a response that said it was within the lawful exercise of Sarah Jane Baker's freedom of expression to, to exhort the crowd to punch women in the face. Uh, but after a lot of women um, spoke up, particularly the Women's Rights Network and others, um, the Home Secretary stepped in and she um, he was arrested. He, she told the police uh, to get on with it. Um, he was arrested and charged. Uh, and then on September the 1st, he was acquitted. He told the court that it was only a joke. He was just doing it for publicity. Uh, and um, they, they took that and he was acquitted. Uh, so... I was utterly despondent that day. Um, you know, when you have these low moments when you just think everyone is against us, every institution is against us. Um, you know, it's head, it's heads we lose and tails they win. You know, when we're attacked and threatened, the police say, oh, well, they have Article 10 rights. But when we put up stickers or tweet or speak, nobody cares about our Article 10 rights. Um, it, 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 the, the um, strength of importance that's put on the rights seems to go along with which party has the trans identification. Um, and in my case, when I had when I had my case, which I did win eventually, I lost and then I won. But when I won, my the judge in that case put all of this wording around it, which said you cannot misgender with impunity, um, which wasn't 
my case wasn't about misgendering because I hadn't, I didn't have a trans colleague. I hadn't misgendered anyone at work. Um, but the judge wanted to be careful to say that me having rights doesn't mean you can misgender with impunity, which meant fair enough. Um, if you have that, we have a protected uh, belief doesn't mean that you can harass people and you get a get out of jail free card. And so if you do harass somebody and that harassment comes under, part of that is so-called misgendering, you're not able to say, well, it's not harassment because I have this belief. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that misgendering is outlawed, but that's the way that a lot of HR departments have taken it. Um, so, you know, you hear this a lot. You can't misgender people with impunity but you can tell people to punch turfs in the face with impunity, apparently. Um, so I was despondent for about 20 minutes. Um, and then we made that video. So that night we launched that film with a letter to Rishi, to Rishi Sunak, the prime minister. And so far about 12,000 people have signed it. If you're in the UK, you can still sign it. It's on our website. Um, we're trying to get a date to take up to the door on number 10 Downing Street and go and do a photo opportunity of, of handing it in um, and we hope that'll be sometime around in between November 25th and, and December 10th during the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence because this is gender-based violence even though all of the mainstream women's organizations don't want to talk about it. Um, so we wrote the letter to Rishi um, and I'll read a, I'll read a bit out of it. Um, we said we ask you to take urgent action to halt an escalating campaign of violence and intimidation against women in the name of trans rights. Women are being threatened with social ostracism, loss of livelihood and physical violence, shouted down and intimidated at public events and even subject to physical violence, all for insisting on their freedom of belief and freedom of expression and calling for existing sex-based legal protections to be upheld. We urge your government to issue a call for evidence and to commission a rapid review on the impact of extreme trans activism on women's rights, as it has done with other emerging threats to civil liberties and the democratic order. Um, and then we went on and, and told him about, uh, about Sarah Jane Baker. We told him about uh, a whistleblower from the, from the Metropolitan Police who had uh, revealed that they had an official day the Trans Day of Remembrance in the Metropolitan Police, uh, where the speaker told officers that anyone concerned about transgender ideology was a bully and a bigot motivated by hate. And when they mentioned the name Posey Parker, uh, Kelly J. Keene, officers booed and hissed. And so we told him about all of that. Um, and we told him about the, the signs saying decapitate turfs and people J.K. Rowling um, and asked him to take the to take this up. Um, amazingly, the next day, the Home Secretary wrote a letter to the police. Um, we thought this is this is uh, this is amazing. Obviously, it wasn't as a result of our letter. She had been working on it um, alongside. She, she must have been thinking about the same things that we were. And in fact, we had been working on that film for quite a while. Um, we didn't just get it done in one day in a fit of anger after Sarah Jane Baker was acquitted. Um, we'd been putting together a film about a little film about uh, violence against women with um, Malcolm Clark and Mr. Menno, who picked the music. I know somebody mentioned the music um, for a while, and we tried it out different ways. The first one we tried, um, we thought it was um, very powerful and affecting, and then we showed it to a man who. Um, is kind of sympathetic, but not really in the trenches of this. And he said, can't understand what's going on here. It looks like a bunch of women fighting. So then we did a second one where we made it the, the Lady Bird book version, where we explained exactly what was going on in each frame. We said, this is a man hitting a woman. This is a man pouring unidentified liquids on a woman's head. Um, said what was going on in each frame. And then at the end said, how does it make you feel? Are you furious? Are you intimidated? Are you angry? Or are you upset that we've used the wrong pronouns? Um, and we thought that was better, but we'd buried Sarah Jane Baker in the middle of it. We didn't know that that was going to be the story. So in a fit of anger on the 1st of September, when Sarah Jane Baker was acquitted, I 
recut the film from scratch, um, put it back together again with that story at the beginning of it, and we released it with a letter to um, to Rishi Sunak. Um, and then, as I say, the Home Secretary had been thinking about the same thing, and she wrote a letter to the Chief Inspector of Police asking him to review how much police involvement in uh, basically politicised policing uh, was affecting the operation of, poli of police forces. And so she's asked him to look at um, policies and processes that go further than the Equality Act or contravene it, training quality and impartiality and the role of external organisations, errors that have been made in relation to operational decision making, um, like things like the Harry Miller case and other people who've been... Um, uh, questioned for hate crimes for stickers and and tweets and so on um the role of independent advisory groups which is which is what was going on with the metropolitan police and the the hissing and booing at the name of posey parker um how they're communicating on social media and whether there are other issues that prevent policing from being impartial or being seen to be impartial uh we think this is a really good list it basically looks like um, the Stonewall Workplace Equality Index, which is what um, quite a few police forces are part of. So every year they report to Stonewall against basically those kind of headings where Stonewall is asking them, what are you doing to erase women? What are you doing to promote transgenderism? What are you doing to um, uh, promote the idea of gender ideology and and basically discriminate, encourage them to discriminate against uh, police officers who are gender critical. Um, so we're very pleased that that's happening, but we know that police forces are ignoring her. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing over the next um, few weeks is collecting information under those headings, writing to the chief constables, writing to the police and crime commissioners, um, collecting a dossier of evidence for the uh, review that she started and basically making a lot of noise about this, particularly during the 16 days of activism um, on male violence against women. Uh, if you haven't signed the letter, please sign it. Um, and um, if you've got evidence for the, for the review, send it in to us. Name for that. So it's violence against a type of woman. We're calling it a campaign of hate against women because I think it is, I mean, it is directed at women who speak out, but like you say, it's directed at women who speak out in order to keep the other women silent. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, you know, it gender critical is quite a sort of technical term, but I think if you can't say what woman is, then you can't protect women's rights. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, it's it's really interesting because it's been completely targeted now on a, women speaking out to defend our rights as women. And um, and it's it's growing and it's all over the world. So it's incredibly good that you're doing that campaign. Um, it seems also it really links up with what the judge said about in your case, where I I've, I was so chilled when I heard his summing up saying, uh, when he when he said that your views were not worthy of respect in a democratic society, and that's so sort of fundamental to the structure of certainly British society, but many societies where um, you are a respectable member of society if you if you have those. And I felt like um, it's it's the same sort of thing. They're trying to make us not worthy of respect and allowing violence absolutely and the two are connected if you know if you make well, we know this from history if you make a group um seen as second class citizens seen as not worthy of respect then you open them up to violence and you allow people to do that with with impunity um and so the 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 critical thing that my case hinged on was um article 17 in the european convention on human rights which is the article that says um you can't use any right to destroy other people's rights, basically. And so if you're trying to, then you're using the convention wrong. And um, that so that was that's where the test of worthy of respect in a democratic society comes from. And it's all about balancing the rights. So when Stonewall said, um, you know, we will not accept that there is a conflict of rights between 
women and trans women, as they say, um, they were they were already saying women's rights are worth zero if they if they disagree with us. Coming up to an election in Britain, and it seems as if there's a lot of opportunity for us to engage with politicians to ask them what their views are. And this the big question, what is a woman? can be answered but have you got any useful questions or if it, it, that we could ask to politicians when they come around knocking on the door on this so, issue so this is the this is the other campaign we're just launching which is um what we're running with is um asking them whether they support single sex services so we're asking them to say i support single sex services and that includes not just um specialist services women's refuges and so on but also everyday services also associations also sports so the whole the whole package of um things that the equality act allows on a single sex basis um we want them to commit to saying that they support it and on you know on one hand that's kind of motherhood and apple pie even the labor party have now said that they support this stuff um but getting them to say it and then you know, having them having committed to it, uh, have to deliver on it in terms of uh, changing the law, uh, up, updating the guidance and standing up for the ability to to have single sex services. That's what that's what we're doing. We know there are other people doing a, a more kind of what is a woman question. Um, and that's fine, too. That's a that's a good thing to ask. But we sort of wanted to get them tied down on um, not just, you know, because Rishi Sunak is saying he knows what a woman is. He says he's the you know, he's the only candidate for prime minister who knows what a woman is. But it's not enough just to know. They also have to um, practically defend women's rights. And the thing that we're asking them to do is to make this um, amendment to the Equality Act, which would then have a whole lot of knock on effects, because um, once you have that clear right that women have protection against sex discrimination on the basis of sex and that when it comes to the public sector equality duty, so that the when organisations have to think about how their policies affect different people with different rights, they have to think about women, female people as a group, not including some women with penises as uh Keir Starmer would have it although he's also now kind of backing away from his his position which was 99% of women don't have penises so I think there will be a lot of yeah. asking every politician every candidate do you know what a woman is which is great but we also want to say will you support single sex services and here's how to do it so that it's not just gotchas and sound bites but it's also um serious policy yeah. Can I ask you as well, because I I think quite a few people would be interested in your uh, campaign in schools about socially transitioning children, because it, it, when you, you told me about that, I think it's it's a great move. And if I think we could get make loads of progress on it. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, a long time. There's been no guidance uh, really for schools on what they should um, do when a child uh, says, I think I'm the wrong sex. I think I'm, I'm born in the wrong body. I want to socially transition. And this has been driven by doctors. It's been driven by the Tavistock Clinic and, and by um, doctors who perhaps thought they were doing the right thing, but didn't really think about schools at all. They just assumed that if they said this child can socially transition, then the school could accommodate that. And at the start of that, these were very small numbers of children. But as we know, they're now, um, you know, they, it's, it's escalated massively over the past 10 years. And no one has ever really thought about how to, what, do schools have to do and what should schools do to accommodate these children? And so it's been assumed that schools um, should accommodate social transition. And then once you have that in a school, it becomes a kind of target for those children and target for other children who are unhappy or autistic or, you know, just going through miserable puberties or whatever, that there is this possibility of social transition and it's celebrated and um, you can do it. And so, you know, the, the kind of school to clinic pipeline accelerates, but nobody at the outset of that said, what about the other children's rights? And what what is a school? What does a school have to do? Um, and so schools have been told by Stonewall and others that the Equality Act tells them that they have to socially transition children. And the underlying thing with this is that 
the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, which covers not just people with a GRC, but anyone who is on any point of a personal journey of transition, whatever that means to them, um, is covered against discrimination. And it does cover children. There's been a legal case in the High Court uh, where that was challenged and they lost. Um, and there's nothing in the legislation that says it doesn't cover children. And so we think it, it does cover children in the same way that the, the protected characteristic of sexual orientation covers children. And there's no legal limit on the age limit. But it doesn't mean that those children should be treated differently. You don't you shouldn't treat children differently in school because of race, because of um uh, sexual orientation because of religion or belief because of dis I mean you should treat children differently because of disability because you have to make reasonable accommodation um, and you treat children differently because of age but the protected characteristic of gender reassignment doesn't mean that the child has changed sex and it doesn't mean the school should treat them differently it just means that schools should make sure that they um, get an education get the same education as other children and are not bullied uh, and so we think looking at not just the Equality Act, but all of the other laws that schools have to follow, because schools are very um, legally constrained, legally created institutions, and they're rules-based institutions. And if you look at all of the other regulations and responsibilities that schools have to record a child's sex, uh, to risk assess situations, to safeguard children, to provide you know safe, suitable toilets and showers and all of those kinds of things, and then the Equality Act, not to discriminate on the basis of sex, also not to discriminate on the basis of gender reassignment. If you look at all of that together and take a deep breath, it doesn't say socially transitioned children. It just says um, treat those children the same as others, the same safeguarding, the same duty of care. Um, and that's what we've been pushing the Department for Education to come out with in their guidance. And it's late. Uh, there's a whole fight going on between the cabinet office, the department for education um, and the government equalities office. Uh, and we really just want them to get out the guidance that they've got now. So, and they're going to do it for consultation. So, you know, just bring it out, let people see it. Um, let us comment on it, let the other side comment on it and then um, see where it lands uh, what we're yeah, most afraid I mean, of it, is that they the don't sooner, get it the out better, at all. Really, isn't yes, it? Exactly. absolutely. We absolutely. want it They've out been... before the election. Absolutely, yeah. we want it out in the next few weeks. But then, and yeah. then, yes, yesterday, the Equality and Human Rights Commission brought out. Uh, they updated this piece of guidance that's been around since 2014, um, quite helpfully. And so, I think that's going to help to push the Department for Education to come out with something uh, good and soon. Uh, I are. Uh... The police allowed to ignore the Home Secretary. Shouldn't she have the power to enforce their compliance? I don't know. Um, and I mean, she should. I don't know enough about how she does it. But I mean, what, she, what she's asked is for the um, uh, chief, in the um, His Majesty's Chief Inspector of Police to do this statutory review. So I think, you know, you kind of go through that process and then come out at the end with this is the problem you must you must deal with it. Um, so she's got a kind of stick. And then the other thing that she's done is she's written to them all and, you know, is in kind of encouraging them to take action. Um, and that's the bit that they're ignoring, I think. Um, so, you know, I think a lot will ride on this, um, the chief inspector's uh, investigation. Um, but also I think, you know, with, with police forces, um, there are some that are better than others and they're, you know, and they're kind of leaders and followers. So I think it's quite significant um, that the um, head of the Metropolitan Police has come out and said, um, we should stop doing this uh, virtue signaling. Um, if he can get that through in the Met, I think that will be quite um, significant and influential on other um, forces. Maya make recommendations for advocacy approaches in the USA based on her knowledge of the complications in our legal system? That's that's always my my least favourite question. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, basically, no, because I don't I mean, I don't have the specific knowledge, but I mean, I think use your legal system, you know, the same as in the UK, there are, you know, schools have rules, um, uh, 
you know, whether it's at the state level or local or national, you know, find the rules that say um, you have duty of care or that say, you know, find the places where it says on paper that sex matters and um, enforce those um, and, uh, you know, sort of use those places. So, you know, I think in the US, um, sport and you know school sport and university sport is is obviously a big a big flashpoint where um some progress is is being made on the issue um but yeah i i'm glad i'm not in the us which is a terrible answer <laughs> there's so many different it's so complicated there we've got uh cara dansky in the chat and she's um sort of very involved but many many people are well that's that's very good um okay next question uh are you working to get the gender ideology out of the classroom yes um and i mean so sex matters you know we're a tiny little organization and we looked at schools and we tried to work out what we thought was the sort of you know the place we could put our hammer and chisel and and make the greatest impact and what we thought was it's this guidance around what you do with um in response to children that want to transition because um that's what creates the facts on the ground if you have a, a group of children who you are presenting as the opposite sex or you're um you're lying about their sex or you're saying you know johnny's come back as as joan next term then then you're creating that narrative with those children and then every all of the kind of teaching will follow that whereas if you have a set of rules that says um we recognize that this child is you know going through mental health issues is vulnerable has particular needs um needs to be protected from bullying but they have not changed sex and they will not change sex you know it, they whatever they do as an adult while they're at school we must treat this child as being the sex that they are we must be able to refer to this child as the sex that they are um then that's what you're presenting to the class as being the situation in the world and then there's a whole another stuff about about teaching and about um RSE and uh, how this stuff's been put into the curriculum but unless you're able to say with you know unless the school's whole ethos about sex is clear then um it's not going to be able to or we're not going to be able to challenge the the teaching materials so for us it seemed like the thing to do was to was to challenge that and also because it's centralized because the department for education so this is just for england there's another set of guidance for scotland another one for wales but it's sort of it's manageable whereas because rse relationship and sex education has no national um uh oversight it, you know it's a kind of wild west it was hard to see where we could change that and so the so the thing we focused on is this guidance but we know that there's a big problem with with the curriculum materials as well can we get sex matters in the us have to start one yourself i mean not not a sex matter so we 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 haven't got chapters anywhere um but you know we're always happy to talk to people who are kind of setting up organizations and, and wanting to learn about what we've done it, our approach is very legally focused and so that means um you know it has to be focused on the specific laws that you've got um and so we you know we can just about cope with england scotland wales northern ireland um but we can't you know it's, it doesn't work for the us for for us to do it um but yeah we're always happy to to talk to people who are thinking about what they're doing yeah but some of the i mean i think this growing understanding about safeguarding being very much you know we can we can win on that in a way we've got a lot of support the schools are very very worried about safeguarding um but, the, because but that's care also a, but that's also strong. a legal framework you know that's yeah. a, U, a uk or um legal framework I mean, yeah. every country has something that whether the way that they think about child protection, um, yeah. but, it, you know, it, it's all different. Is there help for women in political parties and unions? They all seem to be captured. There are women organising in every in every political party. Um, and I know there are women organising in some unions. There isn't. Um, I think Pilgrim has been taught. Pilgrim Tucker has been to, been talking about doing something um broader with the unions but there is um you know in the 
um, teaching union, in the various civil servants unions. Um, I know that there are women organising, but there isn't a single um, there isn't a single campaign on it. And then obviously there's Labour Women's Declaration, Conservatives for Women, uh, Liberal Voices for Women. Uh, I think the Women's Equality Party caucus has just given up because the Women's Equality Party is um, hopeless. Somebody more will tell captured me I, than anyone else. Tell, yeah, <laughs> someone someone will tell me if I got that wrong. It's it's the women's organisations that are more captured than everyone else. It, it's it's tragic. Um, and yeah. the Greens, you know, there are still Greens fighting fighting the good fight. So you know, find yeah. your people. And there's the Green Women's Declaration, which is now really gr- growing in momentum. There, recently. yeah. And and then there's all you know, there are three legal cases against the Green Party. So that's kind of focusing their mind. Does protecting women first make more sense, or interrupting the school narrative first? So uh, I struggle as a US teacher knowing where best to fight. I think as an individual you fight with the tools that you've got you know you like you look at the um you know the leverage that you might have but for sex matters kind of strategically when we started we thought we thought we were all about employment law and we were all about workplace and um how gender ideology is is corrupting all kinds of different sectors and we you know on our website we've got kind of sex matters in the judicial system the police the prisons and so on and and that is still our strategy and then one of those sectors was schools but we've kind of come around to thinking that schools is really really important not just as this kind of big employer and you know a sector that's um affected by this but just because of that demographic flow of you know if you you're trying to kind of recapture the institutions and bring the grown-ups into the room but if you know the next generation and the next generation of kids that are coming through are you know one being damaged and two accepting the gender ideology and then going to university and going into professions and um uh, influencing those organizations that we will never win if we don't win back the schools so I think you know if you're in a position to fight the battle in a school um, you know without losing your job don't lose your job then it's a it's a good place to fight it.